Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my salvation. Thank you, Brother Russell, for reading of that. It's good to go back into Genesis. I don't normally preach from that, not generally or commonly, I guess I should say. What's the first choice mentioned in the Bible, if I asked you? What would be the first choice mentioned in the Bible? Some might say it was Eve or Adam eating the forbidden fruit. But you know that answer would be wrong. No, the first choice begins even before that. Choice begins with God. The first chapter of Genesis, as we all know, gives us an insight into a variety of choices. God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh. First chapter. Why did he take six days? I mean, he's God. He's God. Why not just a moment like that? Why not two days? The fact is, it was God's choice to create everything in six days. Choice is something that God had right from the start. Choice is something that begins with God. God chose to keep the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And where was it placed? In the middle of the garden, just as our brother Russell left it there this morning. He put it right in the center so that there was no chance of Adam and Eve missing it. And then God passed on this gift of choice to mankind. The choices that we make in everyday life determine our future. The choices that we make are very important. It determines our victory and our future. And one wrong choice, one wrong choice can ruin our life. And a right choice can bless us abundantly. God's choice was not influenced by anyone. In Isaiah 40, we hear, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counselor? He is all-powerful and has all wisdom. So God passed on this gift to mankind. Can you imagine for a moment if we did not have the power to choose? All of us would be like some type of robot with no freedom to make a choice. We will be controlled by someone. Bear in mind this gift that he has given to us is extremely important to us. Do you have any idea how many choices you make every day, just on an average day, right from choosing when you are going to get up in the morning and then choosing whether or not you're going to hit the snooze button to go back to sleep. Do I get my left leg out of bed first or my right? You know, do I brush my teeth first or comb my hair? What color dress, what color shirt am I going to wear? And then maybe I should just go back to bed. You know, statistics say that the human beings make roughly 5,000 choices every single day. That's a lot of choices. I have an Apple Watch on here. My Apple Watch can tell me how many breaths I've taken in the last hour or per minute. It can tell you how fast my heart is beating. It can tell you how many steps that I take throughout the course of the day. But it can't tell me how many choices I've made. Do you know at which point we really start making some of the most important choices? It was a while back for most of us. Around 18 to 30 years old, we make and make and made the important choices that decided our future. A time of whether or not we were going to be saved, a time on whether or not what job or career we would follow, our life partner, the education. And some of those choices may have never been reversed, and some never will be reversed. Through youth, 
young adult, middle age or older age, we make choices every day that affect us. Now, coming back to Genesis again. What if I asked you, who made the first wrong choice in the Bible? Now, that's an easy one, Adam and Eve. They disobeyed God and did what God said they must not do. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they were also the first to be tempted, the first to be tempted, as we heard from our earlier scripture this morning. Jesus was tempted, and he made the right choice. Jesus, Judas, as these coins on the worship table this morning, he was tempted, and he also made the wrong choice. Adam and Eve were tempted, and they too made the wrong choice. Why would man make this wrong choice? Simply because when God gives us the choice, it means automatically, he automatically gives us the power to choose between good and bad. We find this discussed in this choice even in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, when Joshua says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witness against us that I have set before us life and death, Blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Amen. Unfortunately, because Adam made the wrong choice, all of us have become fallen beings. Still, interesting enough, God did not take that gift of choice away just because Adam did not make the right choice. Still, to this day, we have the gift of choice. We are not robots, and we are not puppets in God's hands. Rather, he gives us complete freedom. Ecclesiastes 11 says, You who are young, be happy while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Ah, Ah, those days of youth and the choices that we sometimes made. But Ecclesiastes is not over. A little farther in chapter 11, the verse ends like this. But know that for all these things, God will bring us into judgment. You see, it took the second Adam, the second Adam, Jesus, to reverse the poor choices in the young days of Adam and Eve. And when we accept Jesus Christ, our position is restored. He took our sins and gave us his righteousness. He took our shame and gave us his glory. He took the curses and gave us his blessings. He took away death and he gave us life. A divine exchange took place on that cross. And that is why we must remember the choices that we make have such a great significance. Paul echoes this thought in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. And I like the way the, the New Living Translation puts this verse. It says, You say, I am allowed to do anything. But not everything is good for me. You say I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. When we are becoming slave to anything, anything besides Jesus Christ, we are in danger. The consequence could be terrible. So let's think about, meditate on, some important choices that we must make in our lives, no matter where we are in our spiritual life or in our physical life. And now, as we are in that season of Lent, let us affirm our choices. First, we must choose to make Jesus a priority 
in our life. We are not to follow Jesus just as someone in a crowd, but with a sincere heart of a disciple. You hear that? A disciple. In Luke 14, verses 25, 28, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate your father or your mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. There's some tough words there, aren't there? Jesus was essentially telling them that is easy to follow him in a crowd, in a big crowd. Because you see, in a crowd, there's no real personal commitment there. We can walk in anytime, we can walk out anytime. No one will question us because we'd barely be noticed in a large crowd. We're just one in a thousand. And so many people, sadly, prefer to be in a crowd because that's the easy way out. There was an inter interesting illustration about this that I read. A few years back, a psychologist did an interesting experiment with teenagers designed to show how people respond to peer pressure. You've all heard about peer pressure. They brought groups of 10 teams, 10 teens, into a room at different times. Each group was instructed to raise their hand when the teacher would point to the screen. And when that screen showed the longest line, there was a whole series of different lines. And when the longest one came up, they were to raise their hand. But there was only one person in the group of 10 that didn't know that the teacher had already talked to the nine others before they came in. And the teacher told the other nine folks, when you see the second longest line, raise your hand. So each group that came in, when the second longest line was up there, nine out of the 10 raised their hand. The one who wasn't given that instruction, who was looking for the longest line, would look around and see the other nine with their hands in the air, 80% of the time, that person finally raised his hand. Peer pressure. Regardless of the instructions they heard, they raised their hand. The psychologist concluded the study that most people would rather fit in than to be right. As Christians, we are not called to fit in, to only fit into the crowd, but we are called to stand out. So when Jesus said what Luke recorded, he's asking us to prioritize God over and above everything else in our life, to choose Jesus. God wants him to be our focus at all times. He means that our allegiance and our love for our Jesus must be so great that by comparison of our love even for our families and even for our own lives, looks dim. Our choice to follow Jesus, to stand out with all our heart, is the first best decision we can ever make. He should be my delight and his words should be my delight. Also, we must always choose what we think and what we speak. Now, you know what? You might say, hey, what I think is my business. What I think is my business. It doesn't matter. Sisters and brothers, it does matter what you think. We need to be careful in what we think. As rightly said, our thoughts become our words. Our words become our action. Our action becomes our habit, and our habit becomes our character. Paul writes in Philippians, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, 
whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You know, many falls in our spiritual life begin in our thought life. We might think that they come from our heart and our soul, but many times they start right up here, 18 inches away from our heart. You know, no one sins immediately. He thinks about the sin again and again. And finally, when, a, when one actually commits that sin, it no longer hurts him because he has already played it out in his mind so many times. See, the evil one, the evil one attacks the mind first. And that is why we need to be careful what this mind thinks. Remember how Satan played with Eve? He made her believe in her mind the lies that he had said. He made her doubt God's word. He was playing tricks in her mind. Philippians 2, chapter 5, Paul again says, Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. And also we must choose the words that we speak. Make sure we speak words of faith into our future. And God has given us power of that tongue. What we speak will happen. Job 22, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus said something very interesting. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey. And this verse, see this verse talks about great things, a mustard seed size faith can do. But there's a lot more to it. The verse also says say. It is important we speak out words of faith to see the impossible become the possible. We find Jesus saying a similar thing in Matthew 17. Truly, I tell you, if you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus really liked that mustard seed concept, didn't he? You know, speaking over the mountains in our life is important. And we must speak positive words, faith-filled words, and not words of disbelief. Every morning, we can choose along with what time we're getting up or what time we go to bed, what we wear. We can confess with our mouths positive things about ourselves. Things like, I am a child of God. I am accepted by God. I am beautifully and wonderfully made. I am what God says about me. Our, our identity in Christ is very important. Thinking and speaking are important. <laughs> Perhaps you remember that old Sunday school song that we learned so many years ago. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. We had it right then. Let's pray we continue. And finally, Choose to depend on God for our future. Have you struggled to make a choice in your life? All of us have, right? At some point in time. Or maybe some of us are struggling with a choice right now. How can we make the right choice? We don't know what will happen five years from now. How can we make a right choice right now? Or how can we be sure that the choice that we made was the right choice? If we want to make the right choice for our future, we need to consult the one who holds in his hand our future, our God. Our wisdom can cheat us. Our circumstances can cheat us. 
But brothers and sisters, God will never fail us. Yes, choices are important. They may be stressful, but they prove that we are still alive. If we're making choices, we're still alive. So let us be careful, little eye. Let us be careful, little hands, little mouth, what we do. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little whatever you do. Amen.